Welcome to Real Estate Investing Abundance, the show for busy, fulfilled professionals like you to learn how to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alan Lomax. Hello, enlightened investors. Happy to be back with you again today. I'm your host, Dr. Allen. I know you'll enjoy today's show, and I have a big ask that will only take a moment of your time. Ratings and reviews are the lifeblood of our podcast. To leave a review and a rating, iPhone or other Apple iOS device users, go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes. For all you non-Apple device users, go to podchasers.com. On either site, search for Real Estate Investing Abundance. Once you find us, leave both a review and a rating. Subscriptions are also vital to the show's success, so please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. It's free to subscribe, and you can unsubscribe at any time. Enlightened investors, the world is changing, but real estate is not. Our guest backs up that claim with almost 30 years in the business as not only a syndicator investing in multifamily and industrial sectors, but also as a developer focused primarily in the Boise, Idaho market. His development projects range from apartment complexes, police and fire stations, churches, offices, industrial flex, and warehouse. Enlightened investors settle in and explore together the riches of these three decades of experience. Welcome to the show, Shannon Robnett. Thank you, Dr. Allen. I appreciate that. Uh, Shannon, before we get into your life as a businessman and entrepreneur, share with us an experience from your formative years that helped you to be the person you are today. It was funny. I didn't grow up thinking that someday I would be referred to as the guy with three decades of experience. But that's exactly where life takes you. And I remember I come from an entrepreneurial family. I'm a second generation builder developer and a fourth generation realtor. And I remember when one summer my parents decided that my brother and I needed jobs, but instead of getting us jobs, they rented a snow cone shack. And it was our first business. I was uh, 13. My younger brother was 11. And they rented this snow shack for us. And Dr. Allen, you can imagine all of our friends were our friends for that first week because everybody got free snow cones. And then when it came time to pay the bills, we had no money because we didn't charge anybody anything. And then we had to figure out a schedule because we didn't want to work all the time and we wanted to have fun. And there was a really good hamburger stand right next to it. And we always were dipping into the cash box, taking money out, putting IOUs in. And when it came time to get paid at the end of the week, boy, that first week, I tell you, was a real disaster for us because we didn't make any money. And I think that was one of the things that that really showed me the importance of understanding. I I didn't know it at the time, but a budget, uh, a schedule, uh, having an understanding of what your overhead costs were, what your fixed costs were. And I really, I often refer back to that and realize that very first business that I had at 13 was a very flavorful way, no pun intended, to teach me about All of those things wrapped up into a fun summer experience that my brother and I actually did for two summers in a row, but it was a, it was an excellent learning experience and it taught me not to really work for anybody and how that can, even that can be a great experience and can be fun. Did it turn out to be successful in terms of financial? Yes. At the end of the summer, my brother and I decided uh, that we were paying ourselves $3 an hour and that we hired a third person and we had a very simple schedule. You worked the morning, the other person worked the afternoon and the third person had the day off. And I think at the end of that first summer, I had about $1,500 left over in my savings account, which for a 13 year old kid in the, what was that? About 86, that was a lot of money. And so I was, I was, that was definitely a success. And it was one of those lessons that you really couldn't fail at, but it it was definitely a teaching moment. You say that real estate is for everyone if you're willing to add value to the conversation. What is it that you mean? Dr. Allen, I get approached by a lot of people that say, I can't get into real estate. I don't know how. I don't know this. But let me give you a story about my first deal. I was working for my father. One of the few times that I worked for someone else, and I was was working for my father as as the superintendent on a warehouse job, and I got to know the neighbor. And she was an elderly lady in her late 60s, probably early 70s. And she had a a son with a learning disability who was in his late 30s. And they lived in an old house on an industrial piece of property. And they realized that their neighborhood was changing into industrial. We were building a very large warehouse next door. And as I got to befriend them, 
I realized that I could solve their problem for them because they did they wanted to sell their property. The problem was their property was zoned industrial. And so anybody else coming in would want it for industrial. I also got to know my crane operator on my job and my crane operator was looking for a place to park his equipment. And so I very quickly put two and two together. I went back to my wife and I said, I need all of our savings. I need the 500 bucks that we have because we were newly married. I was, she was fresh out of high school and I was 20. Uh, one at the time, and we had just uh, gotten married and moved into our own one bedroom, one bath palace. And and so I put that $500 on that real estate contract and I did what was uh, a simultaneous close. And I, I sold the property to my crane operator because I listened to the person around me. And so I had both elements, but the reality is there, Dr. Allen, is there are two, two elements to every deal. There's the deal and then there's the money. And and then really there's a third element, which is the experience. But if you can come up with one of those three elements, you can be a part of a real estate transaction. What tends to happen is people don't open their eyes and ears to what's going on around them. They don't call on the sign that just went up at the end of the street. They don't make themselves available to be the bird dog because there was a lot of deals that I put together that a lot of other people made a lot more money than I did. But I really didn't do much more than drag the deal to the table and say, hey, guys, what can we do? But then as the experts were sitting around doing what they do on the deal, I learned all I know today by watching them carve it up, by watching them entitle it, by watching them build it out, by watching them do all the things that they were able to do. I was able to get the deal done and I learned on the job by just going out and being that bird dog in the very beginning. So being part of the conversation is either bringing the deal or bringing the money or the third thing is what? Working the deal? Is that the yeah. third aspect the of the conversation? Yeah. Having the experience. So now I have people come to me on uh, the syndication side that they have the money. I have people come to me on the bird dog side and they have the deal. And they come to me because of that thing you mentioned earlier, that three decades of experience. And so we're able to put deals together like that all the time because there are really three three elements to the deal. But in this particular simplified case, there was just there was just the need for two. And by paying attention to your surroundings, you'd be surprised how much real estate happens around you every day. How many real estate transactions are in process around you every day? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. As an industry-leading, relationship-focused, design-built construction firm, Mosaic Construction has worked in many different asset classes from multifamily to retail, medical, industrial, and commercial. Mosaic Construction works to execute interior and exterior renovations with their team of trades and project managers. Their experience with value-add improvements has resulted in increased ROI and long-term value of the assets. They work nationally in partnership with local trades to deliver thoughtful, problem-solving construction management solutions to all their clients. For a personal no-obligation consultation, call Ira Singer, 773-491-3145, or email Ira at mosaicconstruction.net. You can also find Ira on LinkedIn. Well, that's a good lesson. You had mentioned that you're, I don't know, a fourth or fifth generation real estate family. I expect some of that rubbed off. It's funny, when I first read Rich Dad, Poor Dad at the age of 20, I wasn't impressed. I didn't understand why this book was such a such a sensation because this looked like my living room on a weekly basis. This looked like our dining room table. We were always talking about deals. In fact, I think I was talking about 1031s before I was out of high school just because that was how my family grew up. And I am a fourth generation realtor. My son is 24. He's a fifth generation realtor. We definitely have it in our blood. So it, it, and it was an interesting way to grow up. That's for sure. Yeah, a, a pretty wonderful way to grow up in a lot of respects. You say if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. There's a lot of different ways that said. If you're, there's the saying you can't pour from an empty cup. There's the saying uh, the, that you're the sum of your five, the, the people you spend the most time with, the five people you spend the most time with. And if you're looking around and you're not, and there's also the, the Bible verse that says iron sharpens iron. And if you're not in a room where you're getting challenged, where you're in a room where everybody's looking up to you, uh, you're not getting challenged, you're not learning, you're not growing, and the opposite of growing is dying. And in that regard, if you're in a room where you're constantly giving out to everybody else and, and you're not learning more, then you're on your way out and you are that one trick pony that's not learning a new trick. Because the guy that sold typewriters in the 70s is now 
had to learn a new trick because we don't buy typewriters anymore. And the guy that sold computers in the 80s in a retail store, he's had to learn a new trick too, because if we buy computers, we buy them on another computer and have them shipped to us. We don't even go to the store to get those. So there's a lot of that says if you're in the same rut, if you're in the same place doing the same thing, hanging out with the same people, you're not growing. And if you're not growing, then you're going to get passed by. That is so true. But it is so comfortable in that room where you're the smartest guy in the room. And it feels so good. But yeah, we have to get out of that comfort zone if we're going to grow and develop. Talk just a little bit about tax strategies. They're a very important part to to real estate investing. And of course, uh, a lot of people who own single family homes realize that, yeah, that's a nice tax deduction, but it gets even better for investors. So talk to us a little bit about taxes and real estate. I think I think that's one of the most overlooked. Most people look at the tax code as a penal code, and it's not. It is a roadmap on how to do the most tax advantage things in your life. And I'm a bit of a fanatic when it comes to finding ways out of paying taxes to the point that I actually live in Puerto Rico for my tax residents. And I, and I spend 183 days a year there and pay no federal income tax because I take that to the extreme. But there are so many ways to pay attention to bonus depreciation and to pay attention to, we're a ground up developer here in Idaho. And so we build brand new buildings. And when we do that, we're entitled to another one called a 45L, uh, which is a energy efficiency tax credit. And being able to be in a tax tax strategic investment allows you to control when and how you pay the government. For example, if you're a high wage earner, you've got a great W-2, getting that bonus depreciation comes to you as a 37% present, right? Because you're able to take that against your highest and top wage, and you're doing that in a passive way. And when you get done with that asset and you've used that bonus depreciation and you've done all those things and you sell that capital gained, that capital appreciated asset, as and, and you, even if you don't do a 1031 exchange, because it 1031 exchange is not tax avoidance, it's tax deferral. Even when you sell it, you're paying capital gains at 18%. So really, you've taken advantage of a 37% tax advantage, and you've paid that back to the government when it's time to pay at 18%. And last time I calculated that 19% spent very nicely at any grocery store or car dealership or vacation spot of your choice. And so I I look at that and, and go, there's a lot of ways, even if you're just building, like a lot of people are doing now, a, a build for rent type of a scenario where they're buying brand new single family homes. They're holding them for a couple of years. They're appreciating. They're taking that bonus depreciation. I don't know if you can take bonus depreciation on single family, but they're taking that depreciation. They're selling it. They're paying their taxes at that point. But it, that whole strategy has been to take their ordinary income that is out of their day job and reduce that and pay that in a capital gains redu- reduced rate. And so by doing that, they're adding a lot to their bottom line of what their profitability would be were they just to turn that into additional time and effort at work. I like your perspective. I don't think I've ever heard anybody put it in quite that same way that taxes are not punitive. They are incentives. You mentioned a whole lot of different ways and means to go about that. From what I hear you saying, it's going to depend upon what it is that you're doing. If you've got a W-2 job, you're going to need a whole different strategy than if, like yourself, a developer because the incentives are going to vary from place to place and person to person. Yeah. And Dr. Allen, to add to that a little bit, one of the things that I love to do when I sit down with an investor initially is just ask them what their strategy is, what their desire is, and then ask them if they're wanting to take into account all of the additional tax advantages that they can. Because when you apply the tax strategies to it, it really does make a difference, especially if you live in a high tax state, say California or New York, where you're not only paying the federal income tax that we all enjoy, but you get to pay an exceptionally high state tax as well. And so when you're able to add those tax strategies together, it makes a lot of difference. So when we talk with investors, we want to make sure that we understand their holistic picture and we understand what makes them the most end game money which may have tax strategies involved. It may involve a self-directed IRA uh, as a vehicle to invest through. There's just a lot of different things that can be very helpful. And we always like to have that conversation up front. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Would you ever invest all your money in a single stock? Very unlikely. 
Yet investors are willing to risk $50,000 to $100,000 in a single property in real estate all the time. Avestor is the world's first customizable real estate investment platform. Investors can build their own custom portfolios selecting investments across multiple asset classes such as single-family homes, multifamily, student housing, self-storage, and shopping centers. You can also invest across multiple markets and different time frames. Avestor also enables other real estate entrepreneurs and syndicators to build and use Avestor's infrastructure and cloud platform to create their own customizable real estate funds. To learn more, visit us at avestorinc.com. Avestor, real estate investing made simple. Is your local CPA likely to have this kind of knowledge or do you need a CPA who has a background in investing? Yeah, I appreciate the softball question there. That was perfectly set up. Your CPA will not know this stuff. Your CPA, and and I say this because I have an excellent CPA who we have trained each other, but I don't rely on her because what I've found the majority of CPAs do is they are organizers. They put all of the things in. They've read the tax code. They take all of your receipts. They take that shoebox that you bring in of disorganized paperwork. They put it in rows and columns, and they check the boxes of the 1040 EZ or whatever other form you need to have, your K-1, all of those other things. And they file that in defense of you to the IRS. And they are creating a, a documented paper trail to the IRS that says, this is the amount that Dr. Allen owns, owes you. This is the amount that Shannon owes you. And at the end of the day, that's not what they do. They don't come up with those creative solutions. And so I I have quite a few, I have a couple of people that I use that all they are is tax strategists. They are the people that look out in the real estate world. They're involved in the investment world. They're talking with all different kinds of people from all different walks of life, all different businesses to see what all you can do to take advantage of a lot of different things to make sure that your tax strategies are solid so that when you take those to your CPA, you could make sure that you're doing the best for yourself. And I always encourage everybody, everybody always shows up at their CPA's office about March of the year, banging on the door frantically going, oh my God, you've got to save me. I made all this money and I don't know what to do, but your goose is cooked. I always sit down with my accountant in June and again in November because number one, they're not that busy. And number two, that is the time to plan for how the year is going to end. Do I need to buy more equipment? Do I need to buy depreciatable items? Do we need to defer this sale until January? Or what is it that we're going to do so that we're all on board and I'm aware of my tax consequences almost every step of the way, and I'm not that far out on on that kind of information? Where do you find these people? Are they attorneys? Are they CPAs that specialize in taxes? How do you go about locating these people? And that's a great question. I've met some of them through my CPA. I've met another person, another one of these guys on Clubhouse who is just a a straight up tax strategist. I've been introduced to a couple others on LinkedIn who I've connected with. Because to me, when I look at it, when I can help you, Dr. Allen, when we're going to do an investment and you're going to invest $100,000 with me and we're looking at a 20% return as far as that goes, and I can help save you an additional 30% by doing it in a tax strategic way, that puts your investment return up to about 28%, which is pretty substantial in in the realm of things. So I've made it a point to make sure that I'm introduced to those people, that I'm working with those people. And I have them as a referral source because they are like unicorns. They're not. They're more like finding a leprechaun riding a unicorn. But when you find them and you find a good one, you've really got an ally there that's going to be able to help save you that additional bump that's really going to make a great deal even better. How do you help your investors start out from that strategic perspective and to set the goals they need from the beginning of any investment strategies? After we've had the initial conversation and we've talked about it and we've said, okay, uh, Dr. Allen, uh, I get a picture here that you'd like to invest with us. That's great. Do you have any self-directed IRAs? Do you have any carryover losses from another business that we could maybe look at? Are you looking at a short-term growth investment? Are you looking at a long-term cash flow investment? And we just interview each other because not everybody's a great fit for every deal. It's not, we don't take the mass produced approach where everybody fits in this deal because it, it doesn't. Some people are looking for cash flow. We do some deals where we just had a meeting with our investors last night. We're rolling out of a growth deal where we went in, we built an apartment complex, we stabilized it, we sold it. 
That was the whole intent. From there, we're doing a drop out of the LLC so they can do their own 1031s if they want to. We've got a couple that are doing that. But we were able to put together somewhere between about a 29% annual growth IRR on that deal. But that was the only vehicle that that was. It was purely a growth strategy. We have other deals that are cash flow strategies, but I liken that, Dr. Allen, to the difference between myself and my dad. My dad is 72 years old, 71 years old. He's looking for two things, motorhome fuel and dog food money, because him and mom are trying to travel the world and that's all they need. They have a pile of cash and they need to make it make them money to supply their lifestyle. I myself am in a growth mode. And if you put me in a cash flow deal, I'm going to get bored. I'm going to not like it. I'm going to want out of it. I'm going to think my returns are terrible. And if you try and put my dad in a growth one, he's going to freak out because he's not going to have a payment for a year while this thing's growing. And it's a lot the difference between a typical value add and a ground up development deal. The ground up development deal is a growth deal. There's not steady cash coming out of it, but we're not buying that. So we're we're doing the original value add. And in that, it's a more, it's maybe it's a, it's a longer term between paychecks, but the paychecks are better. And so we really drill into that and make sure that we know who our investors are, that we're not trying to put the wrong person in the right deal. Because I do have one investor that's never been happy with me, but they told me what they wanted. I put them in what they wanted. They they said they wanted growth, and then they called complaining because they hadn't got their first check yet. I had to point them back to the PPM and show them what they were in. And you've got to make sure that we've, we've had that honest interview. We've talked about the tax consequences. And then from there, once we have a complete picture of what your goals are, then we can talk about what I have in my arsenal currently that might fit you. Enlightened Investors will be right back after this important announcement. I have a big ask that will only take a moment of your time. Ratings and reviews are the lifeblood of our podcast. So to leave a review, iPhone or other Apple iOS device users, go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes. For all you non-Apple device users, go to podchasers.com. On either platform, search for Real Estate Investing Abundance. Once found, please leave a review and a rating. Subscriptions are also vital to our show's success, so please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. It is free to subscribe, and you can unsubscribe at any time. Does it also ring true that the growth investment, as opposed to the cash flow, the growth investment is typically considered a riskier investment? Or does that hold true across the board, or is it dependent upon the syndicator? I think the short answer is it depends upon the syndicator. But let me run this analogy by you here, Dr. Allen. If you're looking at buying a value-add apartment complex these days, you might get a 5% discount. And and what I mean by that is you're going to come across a $10 million asset that you could buy for $9.5 million. That's only a 5% discount. Then you're going to do the value add. You're going to put 15% CapEx in the deal. My math is a little rusty, but that means you're at 110% of value before you pull that lever to do the forced depreciation. If you happen to be the person that did that in November of 2019 in Orlando, Florida, and you deployed all your capital by February of 2020, you can see where I'm going. That person was in trouble when Disney World closed down. But if you look at it from the other perspective, if you're in a growth deal and you're in a ground up development, when we go in and do the deal, we have an interest reserve that's designed to carry the project for a a term six to nine months beyond what we assume to be the stabilization period. So when people think about it, they go, oh, ground up development is risky. You always see ground up developers go under. But the reality is in a typical ground up development deal that I do, I can be 64% occupied and still make my payment. And what I mean by that is if you're in a if you're in a value add deal and you've come in with 15% down and you've gotten the bank's money and you're running along and you've expended your capex, you're in trouble because you only have 15% equity. In a ground up deal, we're required to put 25% of the cost or 30% of the cost of the deal into the deal in addition to the interest reserves. So we have a lower threshold of cost because we're, again, we're at cost, not at value. And so we're even lower. Usually a 70% loan to cost is usually like a 40% loan to value, 45% loan to value. So we're in a very low leverage situation, even though people assume that it's the riskier of the two. I'd take a ground up deal all day long than a value add. You mentioned that you can be as active as you want to be without overloading yourself. And by that becoming a not-for-profit company, 
What are you talking about? What I mean by that is you can actually get too busy to forget what you're here for. You can be so busy that you're doing deals and you're a not-for-profit company because you're not making any money. And what I keep getting, what I keep telling my staff and my staff keeps telling me is stay in your swim lane. We, we, we get out here sometimes, Dr. Allen, we go, we're really good at multifamily, but I bet we could try our hand at self-storage. Anybody can do self-storage, right? So let's do some self-storage. And this, this medical office looks like a shiny one we could chase. And have you thought about Bitcoin? And have you thought, of, and pretty soon you're so diversified and you're doing so many things and you're so busy that you forget that the reason that you're here is to do one thing very well, to make money, to pay or to finance the lifestyle that you're looking for, to influence the friends that take care of the people in your organization and to be a good citizen. And so oftentimes we see people that the busier they get, the less profit they make because they've got their eye off the prize and they're looking at doing everything under the sun. And you really can't. Oh, this is for sure. When I, I thought maybe in terms of nonprofit, you were actually talking about those people who actually set up nonprofits to actually be very profitable. No, <laughs> I have gone through periods in my life where I've been so busy that I forgot that the goal was to be financially viable. And in my busyness, I have missed the mark. Identify a target, rich environment, and stay in one area. I think you've just now touched on that, but go a little bit deeper into that. I've been in Idaho for 40 years. I grew up here. I've watched it go from a valley of 100,000 people to close to 800,000 people. We will grow by 20% in the next five years, according to the Department of Labor here in Idaho. And I'm able to sit right here. I, I hear a lot of people doing a deal in Alabama, and then the, the next thing they're doing a deal in Austin. And as long as we're staying with A's, let's go to Annapolis. But they they don't stay in one environment. They don't stay in one marketplace. They don't stay with one property management company. They're all over the board. They've got some that is fixed income or low income. They've got some that is senior. They, they But by staying in one area and keep doing one thing, that one trick pony can do very well for you and it can make you very wealthy. And so if you just stay in that target, if you like Austin, stay in Austin. If you like Houston, stay in Houston. If you like Texas, stay in Texas. But there's no reason to be all over uh, the Mid-South or the, if you like the panhandle, stay in there because there's no, the, the grass isn't always greener on the other side of the fence. And by the time you do all your travel, time you introduce and get to know a new property management company, get them teed up on what you want, you may as well just have stayed right where you were at. Sounds like good advice for the most part, but you could be in a place that is declining in population and declining in opportunities. Would you say stay there? Because there, obviously, there's going to be opportunities if you want to look. What would be your advice to somebody who is living in a location that is losing population and the economy is suffering? Let's be clear, Dr. Allen. I'm not advising anybody to stay in a bad economy. I just have the opportunity to, of living in Idaho has always been a, a, an economy that's been growing. It's always been an increasing economy. And if you're going to make the move, I, I guess I look at people that are, they've got six projects going and they're in six different states where I, I question, why couldn't you just find a second deal? If you'd have spent the time you spent traveling from here to Memphis to you know, Nashville, over back down to you know, Tallahassee, if you would have just spent that time scouring that area, making those friendships, building those networks in Memphis, maybe you could have picked up a second deal in that same amount of time. Might not be as sexy because you're not working in five different states, but then again, you add the sixth state of confusion and now you're really in trouble. Yeah, I think you're right. It's best to Stay with what you know. Shannon, before we go into our last segment, tell our viewers and listeners how they can get in touch with you to take advantage of these three decades of experience. You can reach me at shannonrobnet.com or you can find us at myverticalequity.com. Either of those will take you there. I'm on all the social channels. You can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Clubhouse, Instagram. So I can be found just about anywhere. Drop me a line. I love talking to new people. I love hearing what you're doing. I'd love to set up a phone call to get to know each other better or a Zoom meeting in the 21st century. So that's where you can find me. And please don't hesitate to reach out. Well, Shannon, share with us one of life's most difficult setbacks and how did you come through that time and what did you learn from it? 2008 was pretty difficult. 2009 
became increasingly more difficult. 2010 was even harder. And in my entrepreneurial spirit, I I saw that we were going to need to make some radical changes. And I put together a trucking company because here in Idaho, we were very close. We had five mobile home factories here in Boise in the surrounding area. And we had the Bakken oil boom going on in North Dakota. And in a very short period of time, I went from, I'd had my CDL license, my heavy haul license since I was 19. But in a very short period of time, we went from one truck, it was a 1989 cab over Kenworth, to a, a fleet of six and, and the second largest oversized trucking fleet in the Northwest, hauling mobile homes to North Dakota because we knew we needed to do something. We had some mishaps and we had some accidents and we tried to haul a couple of bridges and that didn't work out very well, but we did our best and we really learned that that hard work and perseverance really put things back on the right track. I was able to build that company in 2014, sell that to another gentleman that had the opportunity to run it and make a living for his family. But what I found was that it doesn't really matter what your skill set is. If you don't have hard work, it's not going to work. I heard somebody say it the best today, nothing works if you don't. And the reality is you can take the best of circumstances or the worst of circumstances and turn them around 180 degrees with your work ethic, meaning you could be a silver spoon and life handed to you on a platter with no work ethic and you won't last. Or you could be somebody with that starts with nothing but hustle, drive, determination, and you could do you could change everything in your life. And I know that in that three-year span that I built that trucking company, I was driving 55 to 60,000 miles a year. It was nothing for me to put on 4,000 miles a week. And uh, we were able to get a lot of those things taken care of and done. And I was able to build another successful company. So I would say to people that your work ethic is going to determine a lot of where you go in life. I think there's an element besides just hard work. I think it's work smart. And I did learn from that, that I could have worked a lot smarter, but I did work hard. For what in your life do you feel most grateful? I feel incredibly blessed and grateful for my family. Family is one of those things you don't get to pick them. Sometimes you wish you could trade them in, but I feel most grateful for the lessons that they've taught me. I was raised in a family where we worked together. We did deals together. I learned very early on the value of money, but that that your family was never something you could equate to a dollar. And people weren't something you bought or sold. They were they were your privileges in life. And so I feel incredibly blessed to have the family that I have, the wife that I have, the kids that I have. And I think that's the true measure of a man is what he has in those areas of his life. Share with us three good things that you've experienced in the last 24 hours. The breath in my lungs, I woke up with that this morning. There were some people that didn't. And so I'm very, I, I experienced that. And I was able to sit in a meeting with a couple of employees watching what we're putting together as far as systems. And I feel so blessed to be working with the people that I am working with. I have an incredibly talented team. And I, I did have a meeting last night with a group of investors. We're exiting a project. And just to get, you can't get a standing ovation on Zoom, but I did get claps from my investors. And when they saw what their returns were going to be, and they saw how well this this deal had gone for them. So I think those are three very important things that I have received in the last 24 hours. How are you putting your success as an investor and entrepreneur to work to create universal well-being and abundance for all beings. One of the things that's easy for me, we are in the construction business. And when we finish a project, we're able to take a lot of those extra things, those sinks that got ordered wrong, or the, the, the extra stairs that we had, or the extra building material, and we get involved with Habitat for Humanity. I think that's a very important thing because shelter is something that every human being deserves and needs. And so we're able to be involved with that and give back to that community. And I think that's a very important thing to do. When you leave this world, what do you want as your epitaph? That one kind of stopped me. I think I would want people to be able to say that I actually cared, that I was not, that I was actually invested in the investor. Wonderful epitaph. It's something we should all remember. It's uh, so easy, I think, in our society to put property above people. And we need to reverse that in so many yeah. ways. Shannon, it has been a real pleasure. And I have learned a whole lot. So thank you for being on the show today. Well, thank you, Dr. Allen. I sure appreciate it being on the show. And I hope your listeners get something out of it. Thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing Abundance, brought to you by Steve Talker Capital a company working for passionate professionals like you to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. 
As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steve Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steve Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures, great and small, flourish abundantly. For resources to develop your financial independence, connect with us at stevetalker.com.